It's magic time. Magic. Go, go, go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Board Game Barrage podcast. This is episode number 47, and this is the second in our five-part video series on our top 50 games of all time. So uh, if you haven't been checking us out on YouTube, if you want to see our faces, go do that. Yeah. And here they this are for them. those. Yeah. <laughs> um, Watch yeah. Uh, I think never go with a five-part anything as an intro to something. <laughs> right, exactly. I'd say three-part. If this is even, your first time, yeah. Even just video. one and a sequel yeah. would be sort of advantageous. <laughs> right. That's a pro tip. Uh, my name is Neelan. These are my hosts, Mark and Kellen. Hey. Hello. And how are you guys feeling around round two? Good to go? Yeah, excited to see what's on your, uh, your list and to start talking about. The truly uh, best games. <laughs> the actual ones. are on my list. Yeah. Mine are chock full of Euro games. Just wall to wall. That's what the people expect. Euro that. games. Yep. I'm so excited to share them. <laughs> uh, okay, let's dive right in. Kellen, do you want to start us off today? Yeah, so this is the my number 40th best game of all time, and that game is For Sale. Uh, For Sale is a fantastic game, uh, filler game plus, I would say. There's sort of two halves to a game of For Sale. Uh, at the beginning, you are acquiring property, and at the end, you are using that property to make money. I, the, the theme doesn't right. it doesn't hold up to much scrutiny, um, but essentially what it is 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 two really cool, unique... Is one of them an auction, even? I'm not even sure. Yeah. They're... Um, yeah, there's... Well, is it... I'm not, I'm not doing a great job explaining <laughs> this here on the upfront, but this game is uh, essentially a Biblios killer. Um, which is that's not right. It, it's yeah. more. It's you both, start. You want to start to not, this episode with that. Uh, <laughs> it's both more talk? fun, and there's more strategy in it. Wow. So that's strange. That is wrong. You can now disregard the rest of his list. Uh, if they don't cut this part of it out, uh, please check out for sale. It is a fantastic filler game that you can get uh, everyone into. Um, I've had tremendous success with this. And, and one of the things that I love about it is I've been playing this for more than five years at this point. This is not a flash in the pan sort of filler. Yeah, that's fun. For Sale is a great game. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's I totally agree. Uh, it is not a Biblios killer. Though, I agree. It is not a Biblios killer. There you go. Killer. Two to one, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty normal. Um, my number 40 uh, is a game that I liked quite a bit even though I had never played uh, the type of game that it's based on and despite the fact that I had the worst experience possible playing it uh, in terms of like how well I did. This is Guards of Atlantis, uh, the tabletop MOBA by Artem Nichiporov. Yeah, I think that's Sounds right. right. Um, so this is, uh, as I mentioned, a MOBA style game, which is uh, a type of video game. Uh, you've got a number of lanes you're trying to control and you're trying to push your uh, troops down the lane in order to get to the uh, opponent's uh, castle. What is it? In the, in the uh, it's a, I, I guess, well, I don't know what it's called, a fortress? Maybe? Yeah, or base. Something you're trying, like to, you're trying to get yeah, your guys base. over to the other side. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, I had a terrible time playing it. I mean, I played poorly and our team got rocked. Neil yep. was the leader of that team, so... <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. some of this one. Um, I beat you even one versus two. W what? Well, it was three on three. Your well, math is, I, his math, your math doesn't check out as right, usual. It's I guess. selective. Anyhow, um, what I love about this game is the fact that each of the characters are asymmetric and the fact that you uh, can sort of uh, form your teams in a way to take advantage of your of the characters' differences. Uh, that seems really cool. Like each person is unique, but you can sort of create a team and the fact that it's team versus team i was like a team versus team game um i also like the fact uh, of the way that uh your actions are, are handled do you this it's got an action selection uh, aspect where you're putting down a card at the same time and highest initiative goes first and these cards can be upgraded quite a bit uh during the game uh at, once you have uh killed characters and get the money to upgrade them i didn't experience any upgrading because i didn't have i had a, my like my first kill in the very last turn of the game <laughs> Um, but it's just a very, it seems like a very dynamic, uh, very, again, asymmetrical, um, interesting, interesting game. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I can't wait to, to give it another shot and, uh, and, uh, yeah, my number 40 is, uh, Guards of Atlantis. Yeah, that, that's yes. a fantastic game. It's definitely going to be on my list, um, later on. It's, yeah, I, I think if you're a fan of that sort of genre of video games, it does a really good god, a really good job of like replicating it and yeah. streamlining off the edges that doesn't need, don't need to be there. So yeah, and again, even if you have never played, which I'd, I'd never played a uh, a MOBA game and I loved it. So. Right, Guards of Atlantis. Uh, okay, my number forty is a game that was on I think Kellen's list earlier. Uh, is Hanami Koji? 
Uh, yep. It's a fantastic two-player game. Kellen already mentioned it last episode. Uh, as we said, like the things I like about it is that that high stress tension where every move feels bad. Like everything you decide to do, you're like, I don't know what the other person is going to do to <laughs> right. like wreck me. I hope right. I've set this up just right. There's also something uh, so clever about the way that the numbers just work out. Like all these actions feel so disparate. It's like one of them is use four cards in your hand. One of them is use one. And then it somehow just always works out because yeah. of how cleverly designed, how perfectly designed the, the, the maths on it is. Um, it's just a really it, easy to explain high stress game that is great at two players. I well, it's, it. it's a great two player I game. I love it. Didn't make, I just missed my list, but I do like it quite a bit. Uh, yeah, that's Hanami Koji. Is it number like 300 it's in there? Number 83, which is high praise. <laughs> How do you know it's number 83? I just oh, you checked. It up. I always okay. look to make sure you guys are make, not making big mistakes. <laughs> where's we, we where's For Sale? Cut. For Sale's got to be in for there. For Sale's up there. For Sale. I'll let you know. All right. Let me get back to it. Uh, my number 39th best game of all time is a Stefan Feld game, guys. Wow. Mm. Look at Whoa, this. Oh, it's happening. It's a Euro game. Uh, that game is Bruges. Um, but actually, I think the true Europhiles actually don't like Bruges because it's a little wackier than some of his other games. Uh, it, this is a point salad. I like some salad. Uh, <laughs> it has a lot of multi-use cards, uh, which is super fun. Uh, there's suits of sort of different people. I don't know if they're villagers or what they call them in Bruges. Um, but you're essentially using these cards and, and doing a bunch of disparate effects. This is a really hard to find game. I'm actually still trying to find it. I know you probably own it. I do. Um, I, I own it along along with the very very hard to find expansion, which is where do you store your games, Mark? <laughs> in the gymnasium, yeah, right. you in your gymnasium. Yeah, that's right. I see. Okay. Yes. Um, no, Bruges is a game that I have only played a handful of times, but I'm always excited to play it again. Uh, it's on my list of games to pick up whenever I find it. Um, and I, I, I like having some games in my collection that are sort of a um, uh, holding a uh, holding a hand a handout to you guys not a handout a handout <laughs> has a different connotation but it's sort of that me reaching out to my Euro brother and and saying we can be friends uh, and Bruges is a, a good bridge for that that's so that very is magnanimous of you thank you <laughs> thank you Mark you got it um, my number or sorry just uh, I think for sale was one thirty eight just so you know so for sale is better than Hanami Koji. <laughs> If you consulted the only the true <laughs> and living list that we have here, uh, my number one third. Sorry, my number one thirty. My number one thirty eight was for sale. No, yeah. my number thirty nine uh, is by Uwe Rosenberg. Uwe Rosenberg. Sorry, uh, and this is a feast for Odin. Um, Uwe has two, or he's known for his like farming worker or um, resource gathering conversion games, and now he's uh, starting to do these. Uh, Tetris style tiling games and Feast for Odin is sort of the uh, the meeting of both those. It was where he seemed to have gone from mainly going from those the um, farmer farming games to these these uh, tiling games, and this game has both uh, in it. Um, I remember when this game was being released, and there was a talk about this new Rosenberg game where that had like seventy worker placement spots. And right. I thought it would be like like uh, I thought it would be like the differences would be incremental, but I think there's it's not quite like that. it's not like one spot is just a little better than the other which is just a little bit better than the other um there's a lot g going on uh in it i like the fact that you have to when you're gathering the resources you can use them to feed your people or to to score points but also uh to place them on this like tetris like this this tetris style board and you're you're doing it in an effort to get more resources the more and more you fill the board but also to cover up negative points that was a, that's a, the unique concept that he's used in other games now but was uh, novel uh, at the time um yeah this is uh again just uh another like this is like his like it feels like his magnum opus like maybe not his best game but his like grandest game because of again all the the worker placement spots and the fact that he combined both uh both styles of games so 39 for me feast for odin Fantastic game. Have you played this? You have he no... has. He doesn't oh, yeah. love it. I, yeah, I was, we have a general rule, which is like <laughs> if someone is talking about something they like, someone should jump in if they also like it. So I was so trying to silent. I was trying to keep <laughs> quiet. As quiet as but, possible. But the entire premise of worker placement as a genre, right, in the upfront yeah. was to block other spaces from other players. Yeah, I actually wanted to say that I almost don't consider it a worker placement for that reason because it's not about blocking like it's it, it, it's 
too big of a board for that. But, you, but I mean, it's a, obviously is worker placement, yeah. but it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, but they're full. Yeah, no, like, it's like the same. It's baby's first worker placement. That's not, so I mean, irrelevant. That's not that's, that's, No, no, no. Unfair. The game itself isn't. But as a worker placement game, it defangs Agricola. It, it literally it, takes anything cutty and mean. It's, no, that's, that's I don't even think that's true. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's the, not. The, it's not. It's certainly not as like tight as Agricola yeah. in terms of like. But, I mean, but not even in the same league ballpark i think that's I probably true i, I think agree Agri- Agri- is a lot meaner than the it is, it is I'm, I'm not arguing that i just think that there is there are definitely spots that you want in yeah. for odin and and yes you can there's always like a secondary spot that's not that bad right and that's the thing i wanted to say is like like people talk about the 70 work placement spots but they're divided into columns of efficiency right so there are like you know are not as nearly as many, about a quarter of those are the right. best spots that you right. are competing over, yes. and then there are more expensive spots. Right. So right. it's. I would play it. I've played it twice. I think I'd play it again. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. just as a worker placement, Doesn't it takes what, what I like yeah. about I agree. worker placement I that. and, I and takes that. that away from me. Sure. Uh, okay, my number thirty-nine is also a Stefan Felt game. Oh. Um, uh, I think this is the highest, if I'm not mistaken, Stefan Felt game on my list. It is in the year of the dragon. Uh, this game, like on the first playthrough, I played this with Mark both <laughs> yeah. times. Really, just I, I love so it. It's punishing. so brutal. Yeah, yeah. So it's like brutality. Of the game, yeah, right? It's like, that's all it's all about. So the the whole premise is you have like a I believe a year of twelve different yeah. events that are random, semi randomized. Um, you have palaces that you're sort of recruiting people to of different professions. Like one is a builder, one one's an architect. architect there are monks, and each of them do different things in terms of giving you points or uh, getting. Um, money and so on throughout the game but every event if you can't can't fulfill the requirements of the event which is maybe pay x amount of money right. or have this much food then people will die in uh, your palace and that happens all yeah, the time i remember when we were explaining the game was explained to us, right it was like you got to do this or people die and then if you don't do this people die right. like every other line in this game the explanation was Someone or people will dies, die yeah, yeah right so a lot of the times, like you're you're recruiting a person and then you're just killing them immediately right. because yeah. So it's just because you, know, yeah. you yeah you knew that they were never going to survive the round. Right. Um, but it's it's a really cool game. It's got a lot of really interesting mechanics. I think one of the central ones that I like is there's a a track that purely defines player order that you're moving ahead on based on what people you recruit. Yeah. So you're sort of constantly jostling to sort of get ahead on the track just to keep your player order in a good place because obviously getting access to the actions you need is vital. And right. Those actions get blocked by other players otherwise. Yeah, and the fact that like each type of character you can pick up, you can either take the stronger version that right. moves you less up the initiative track right. or take the weaker version that moves that you farther, farther up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a really clever game. Uh, having played it a couple of times now, it, it's just as harsh yes even once you know it but it's it's so satisfying because you like you feel like you're just on the tail edge of just like getting it right yeah Yeah. right um and then things go wrong and it's great yeah not Um, a point salad no not very much not a felting point salad um which might be why i like so much uh (laughs) this uh, that is in the year of the dragon yeah all right the 38th best game of all time mark has never played isn't that a travesty with your giant list (laughs) that game is crokinole uh, Crokinole is uh, perhaps the greatest dexterity. Oh, wow, greatest dexterity game uh, of all time. Um, it is a giant circular board, uh, traditionally made out of wood. Um, there are just beautiful sets of Crokinole that have been made. Uh, essentially, you're trying to flick discs into the center uh, to have them removed from the board, uh, and they're sort of scoring rings in a circle. Um, but what's cool about it is that once an opponent's piece is on the board, in order for your shot to count, you have to hit their piece. So you can't just consistently aim and try to flick it in the middle um, because you must hit their piece uh, prior to uh, it going into the middle in order for that to count. Um, so that le- leads to the whole tension of the game is you're sometimes aiming at an opponent's piece that's on the complete opposite side of the board and it's really challenging to hit. And then if they don't have anything on the board, then that's when you're trying to get your kill shots just going right into the middle. Um, I have a beautiful board uh, of Crokinole on my uh, wall, actually. I have it wall- hung on the wall, and it's it's like art, basically. Um, yeah. It's just like a really, really pretty... I don't know what kind of wood it is. I'm not a... Woodsman. <laughs> Woodsman? Is that the word? <laughs> Maybe. Connoisseur of wood. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's a Halinski board. There are a bunch of companies that make these... Um, it's it's a really fun game. Have either of you played Crokinole? Uh, I, I don't think I have. But I, I like I like the whole curling scoring sort of me- mechanism, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Same. Similar. Yeah. I feel like I might have played your set at one point, but I'm not sure. I brought it to to game night once. Yeah. It's it's huge. It's massive. Uh, I had to buy a gong bag right. to mm. even transport it anywhere. So that's 
that's when you know you've gone too far, perhaps. Into you, ever, the, you ever watch on YouTube like the Coconut World Championships? They're insane. They're, the guys are just like, they just like keep hitting in the middle. It's amazing. I, it's crazy yeah. town. Yeah. Yeah. That is Crokinole, a, a fantastic dexterity game. Uh, my number 38 uh, is by the Spangler Brothers, Ryan and Sean Spangler. This was their first design. This is um, Soul, Last Days of a Star. Uh, this was sort of like an indie game. Came out of nowhere last year. Um, it's a at its heart, it's like an action point uh, allowance game with some like network building. You're trying to uh, the board is uh, concentric, concentric. Is that the yeah, word? yeah, concentric uh, circles, and you're trying to basically build a route, getting toward the center where most of the points are scored. Um, what uh, there's a lot of interesting things about this game uh, that make it that make it one of my favorites. Um, the fact that you've got a mothership that sort of goes around the outer edge and uh, it, all, all these ships move after every turn. So you're constantly moving. There's no variability to that. And it changes where your sort of base of actions are. So it adds an interesting timing effect where sometimes you want to launch ships and to add more, which is basically adding workers to the board, but you want to actually you want to time it so you don't do it now you do it later because it'll get you closer to where you want those ships to be um it's also got uh, a variable ending that i I like so you never know when the game is going to end in the last game we played um i had built a really pretty strong engine but kellen ended up with the win because he had uh like sc- you'd scored most uh, more like early on. So you would had the lead and I, it was insurmountable and the, and the end came uh, fairly early. So I like that. It doesn't, you can't, you have to sort of adjust because I'd had the chance to score more points. Like once I, cause it's, it's based on the, uh, these cards that come out of the deck and once a certain amount of them hit the game is over. So when you start seeing those cards come out, you need to shift your strategy if you're playing long term and, and you haven't been scoring. Uh, so I like that. And also um, another thing I like about it is the fact that there are d- um, a number of different powers that can be introduced in the game. And each game you select six of them and add it. So that adds to the variability of it. Um, and it's just got, it's got a lot of the way the game is even played this network building, this like point scoring where you're scoring points the closer you get to the center, but also your opponents are scoring points based on where they are and what buildings they have. There's a lot of like, interconnected pieces um, that make it a really interesting game. And, uh, nothing quite like it. Um, so yes, my number thirty-eight is Soul: Last Days of a Star. It's it's also like strongly thematic in a way that I think is pretty rare for games where you can imagine this as a movie playing out. Right. It's kind of like the sun is dying and you're yeah. sending your ships in so you get enough boost to like leave the gal- or to leave the solar system and it's right. just it plays the way it's described. Yeah. Like it's it's everything you're doing feels like. That. There's even a move where you can like sacrifice your ships right. to the send sun. them into yeah. the sun right. for that last burst of energy. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's it's a really cool game. Yep. I um I it it just feels like nothing else. You know, imagine in a Euro ish abstract game, you build a a, sub, a building that you want to use, and then it slowly starts drifting away from you. Right. Right. <laughs> and then you try to chase it for a second, and and to to you still use it, and then it's gone. Right. And then it's around going around, and then. You're just like, well, that's gone. I've done that. <laughs> and then at some point, another third of the way through the game, you're like, oh, it's coming back. Right, <laughs> right, I can right. use it again. <laughs> and that that feeling or that thought is so unique. Yeah. I've never felt that way playing a game like this. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, my number 38 game is Comet. This is a dudes on the map game um, that I like. It's certainly not It's certainly not going to be the highest dudes on the map game on my list. Um, I like a lot. It's, it is a mythological egypt setting uh and one of the sort of the key features of the game is that the map is sort of i would say mathematically designed so that every person's base is equidistant from every other person's base and i think kellen's already this is the thing you don't like about it i uh, just mathematically designed is like a positive thing <laughs> right. just, i grimace just a little bit uh so not it, artists it's a certainly it's like a very it's certainly a very specifically cleverly designed map for that purpose like you're you never feel like you're isolated just because of the geography of the board like you can in a lot of games. Um, you're always one or two turns away from attacking someone. And that's awesome because it's a game that entirely revolves around attacking. There's very little, you know, engine building or such. I mean, there are t- power tiles you can sort of get that give you unique abilities, but you're not getting victory points unless you're attacking in, right. in Kemet. Um, which is also kind of neat for that, so the style of game because... There are a lot of games where I think depending on who you play, you might feel hesitant to yeah. attack someone at the table. 
And if you're playing Kemet, then you don't have the yeah, option. Yes. Like there, there aren't any hard feelings because the only way you can interact with the system is to attack someone. Yes, right. I love yeah. that about this game. Yeah. It also has a really cool sort of card playing mechanic, which you, which might be familiar from other games, where you have uh, a hand of six cards, and every time you have a combat, you will use one of those cards until you used all of them. Then you get them all back, and they are varying sort of defense and attack values on them. So finding the right card for the right combat is is vital. Famously uh, yeah. done wrong in Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, this is this is a game that I sort of I, I haven't played as much recently as I'd like to because it's so, somewhat been replaced by more recent uh, dudes on the map games for me. But uh, I really, really like it still. And I, in the few times I've played it in the last um, in the last few months, I've still enjoyed it. So I think if you're into games with uh, tech trees, this really this scratches is a good one. That, yeah, yeah, that itch of like upgrading and looking at all the different powers. Right. right. Uh, it's a little overwhelming for me, which is why I've moved away from that type That's of thing. That's absolutely but true. I'd love to play Comet if you wanted to get it going. And speaking of that, it does actually have one thing that probably bugs me the most about it is that all of these tech tiles are only described using symbols that you have to constantly be referring referring to the manual for, and yeah. that especially as someone that if you've not played it before, that's extremely overwhelming. Um, but that's Kemet. All right. The 37th best game of all time. Um, is this a doctor game? Taj Mahal? It is. Yes. It is. He's so everywhere good. on yeah. my list. Yeah. Taj Mahal. Uh, Taj Mahal was just uh, remade in a new release. Uh, just a, a visual upgrade, but it's the same uh, basic game. Um, what's so clever and interesting about Taj Mahal is that you are using not poker hands, but, but essentially you sort of bid into a... Um, I'm going in for elephants this round. Uh, and then the other players have to try to match or beat you. And, and it's sort of this war of attrition where you really don't want to fight someone else in this sort of card go around. Um, but in order to get the special power that you want, sometimes you have to go big. Um, and your cards are precious, precious resources. Um, so a lot of the game is you know, putting out the vizier or the, uh, the the suit that you're looking for and then just desperately hoping someone doesn't challenge you for right. it <laughs> and someone is likely going to challenge you for it. And then do you have the right mix of cards in your hand to, to maximize your output on each turn? Um, it's a quick playing game for how deep I feel like it is. Um, I've had just a great time playing it every time, just immediately wanting to to run it back um taj mahal has been around for a long time i know you guys have both played a lot yeah of i love I really taj like mahal. it yeah, yeah really really like it um so that is my number 36 37. 37th favorite game taj mahal and that reprint is beautiful as well it is i haven't seen it it's really good looking good components you haven't looked at our instagram mark <laughs> uh on to my number 37 game uh, this is by Matt Leacock and Rob Davio. Matt Leacock of all the Forbidden games and uh, Davio of uh, the Legacy games. And this is uh, the Legacy game, in my opinion. This is Pandemic Legacy Season 1. Uh, I uh, This is oh, this is the third of the four co-ops that appear on my get list. So that's a little for everybody taking notes at home. Um, so I am now uh, definitely burnt out on Legacy games. Uh, I remember when they were hitting their stride i thought i never would be and i thought it was just an, it's such an interesting uh, mechanism but but now i find myself uh not so much uh but pandemic pandemic legacy season one uh what is a fantastic game and it gave me some of the greatest moments uh of my board gaming life um for those who aren't familiar i'm sure most people watching this are it's a spin on the classic pandemic which is probably like the classic co-op game mm -hmm. Um, but the legacy aspect means that the board is changing and cards are being taken out uh, in and out of the game and you are sometimes prompted to open boxes that introduce new characters or new components. Um, so there's a lot of like mystery and excitement when you're doing stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that's, it, it's that part of it. It's a very well-constructed game because Pandemic, Pandemic is a very well-designed game. But it's the, the thing that set Legacy apart um, is the fact that uh, were those moments where you know you're naming your characters and we had we did like a thing where you could only and you're sh you're shifting characters so you you may have one guy in one round but the next game you might take somebody else but whenever a new player is introduced we, you know you write you give them a name and we had a rule that you had to refer to the person playing the game by that character's name and we had like backstories and stuff um and, costumes right well unfortunately but we should have um and yeah, just the opening of the boxes. And I remember like the very first game, uh, they, there's a part where you have to tear a card at the, at the end of it. And I was playing with people who are 
mostly non-gamers and they weren't ready for the, they weren't ready for like legacy games in general but they weren't really ready for that and i just made it a big ceremony of like everybody look and then we, i made sure they had their attention and in the middle of the table i just like, <laughs> ceremoniously like destroyed the car and there was like gasps around the table so um and yeah the audience cheered the <laughs> audience the audience is cheering by, based on the story yeah um so yeah um pandemic legacy legacy season one uh number two overall all-time game on bgg 37 for me but still uh i think uh, a fantastic game so that's my number 37. One day, one day I will yeah. play Pandemic <laughs> Legacy Season 1. I just feel like what we're seeing is that the successful, well, not the successful, the good legacy games are sort of built on a core of something else. Right. I think yeah. Risk Legacy is also seen very well for those who enjoy Risk-like sure. games. And Pandemic Legacy Season 1 is way more well-received than Season 2, which sort of does away with some of the right. fundamental pandemic, pandemic gameplay yeah. uh, versus some of the, the ground-up stuff like Charterstone and, and Seafall are uh, less well-received overall. Um, right. Still potentially fantastic games. It's yeah. almost like its own genre at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My number 37, uh, and this is one where it, I find it really hard to put this on, on my list. Oh, sorry, where to put this on my list. That's Codenames Duet. And the reason for that is because, I mean, Codenames, uh, Codenames, I think, is no surprise, is going to show up later on some or all of our lists, I would assume. But Codenames Duet is such a weird specific spin in it that is almost the same game, but just the virtue of making it cooperative and yeah. adding that slight little complicated twist of the things on the other side makes it somewhat less appealing to me. Like, I think I'll, I'll always be down for a game of code names um, because the team versus team component is yeah. so strong and, like, that comp competition is great. But Codenames Duet doesn't always scratch the right itch for me. And it's so specific because also I think Codenames Duet is probably best at two players. Like, you can do it in two teams, but I feel like it's it's always been best for me at two players. Um, yeah, this is this is a, this is one I sort of want to include because I really sort of I admire just how effectively they translate it to yeah. co-op, but it doesn't quite hit everything I, I like about code names, just because of the added layers of complication and the cooperative nature. Um, that's code names duet. Yeah, because you would never choose to play duet over code names. Yeah, is what that's you're exactly it. If given the right amount of people. Yeah, I, I, exactly. If I could, if I had the ability to play both, I would choose code names every single time. Yeah. Cool. Well, my number thirty-six best game of all time uh, is a, another two player uh, sort of battle line game that's not battle line uh, and that is Pinata. Uh, Pinata is a, a new age remake of a classic two player game called Balloon Cup uh, that a lot of people really enjoy. I've actually never played Balloon Cup. Uh, but in Pinata, you are using a hand of cards and playing on pinatas uh, that you're trying to get candy and you're trying to acquire the different suits. Um, are you trying to acquire enough candy in, in specific colors? Uh, and the pinatas will change. So sometimes you want the lowest total on your side. Sometimes you want the highest total on your side. And once the pinata breaks, it switches to the other side. Uh, this is a really great lighter, a, a little bit lighter, I would say, than Hanami Koji. Uh, one of my favorite things about pinata is that once you've played, you know, each pinata can only have a certain amount of cards. And once you've played all the cards to your side, um, it doesn't resolve until they've played the appropriate cards to their side. And so you can just sit there knowing that you're going to win that pinata, but your opponent's just not playing the cards to, to resolve it, which is infuriating. And then once you've played your cards to your side, you're actually allowed to play on their side um, to end that pinata battle, but it's less efficient to sort of do that. So you want them to do it. Um, what's clever about that is it makes it so you don't want to play your best card on any battle line at first, because you want them to feel like they could win it. So you play like a mid lane card so that they will play a card on the other side. And then <laughs> that's when you, oh, that's, that's when great. you kill them. Yeah. Um, this is very light. Uh, the artwork is meh, but it has a uh, little wooden um, candy uh, pieces, which is cool. Um, it's really good. I like pinata a lot. I would never get rid of it. Uh, Christina and I play it all the time. Sounds great. I'd love to play it. That sounds like right up my alley. It's good. Yeah. My number 36 is uh, probably the biggest outlier on my list. Uh, this was made in 1984, which is the oldest game. Are you peeking? Oh. You're not supposed to peek. All this right. is supposed to be a big reveal. Reveal it. Uh, 1984, and this is the lowest rated game on BGG. This is a 4.6 on BGG, which is terrible for anybody who knows ratings on BGG. Designed by Henry McCow, this is a question of scruples. Mm. Uh, 
so I know this is not for everybody. This game's not for everybody. And in fact, you need to play this with people that you know and like and trust. Uh, because all it is is asking uh, the people around the table like moral quandaries. You, the, the way the game works, and really the best way to play this is not t you know keeping score or anything. But you get a card that either says yes, no, or it depends. And then you get a question that has some sort of qu like moral, morally ambiguous situation. And you need to pick the person around the table that you think is going to answer the, the uh, question with the answer that you've been dealt. So yes, no, or it depends. Uh, and the best way to play this is when you pick the person to answer the question, you are required to explain why. Uh, you need to flesh out why you would sneak into your boss's office or why you would uh, not help the old lady cross the street or whatever. Um, what I love about this game and games like it uh, is the fact that it, it there's a friction there because you're asking uncomfortable questions. But it also, I think in that friction, you sort of are able to bond with your friends more. You, you're able to like learn things about them because it, these games uh, or the question of scruples and games like it um, lead to like a lot of times more interesting conversation. Uh, you get a lot of meandering uh, discussion, which is like fantastic. And um, I just I feel like every time I've played this game, I've gotten closer in some way with the people that I'm playing with. And I just think it's great. It just just brings up the like quote unquote the, the big questions and sometimes and it just it just leads to interesting conversation so uh my number 36 a question of scruples but how do you score points mark uh, i do not know but one interesting thing is the guy who designed this i never heard of him henry mccow and he's listed on bgg officially as a conspiracy theorist Huh. So Wait, what? <laughs> that's what he is he's, he's everybody known for being a conspiracy theorist now yeah so. cool there you go uh, my number 36 game is Dead of Winter. Uh, I think this applies equally to both Dead of Winter and The Long Night, which is a standalone expansion. They're both good. They got pros and cons, but I think either one works. Uh, the premise of this game is it's a cooperative game where you control a number of survivors in the zombie apocalypse. Um, it is also in the middle of winter and you're sort of scavenging for supplies. You need to get a certain amount of food every round in order to keep people at the camp alive. You need to be getting equipment from sort of traveling to different locations and fighting off zombies that are at the coming in at the doors of the of your sort of hideout. Um, the thing I like about this is that each player also has a hidden objective that they have to achieve by the end of the game. So in fact, you cannot win unless you both win cooperatively as a team and have completed your hidden objective. Uh, what's great about that is that you suddenly may be sneaking off to a location and no one quite knows why you're there. And the reason that that's fantastic is because there's also a chance of a hidden traitor in this game. So whenever you're doing something that feels like maybe it's not optimal for the camp, there's this question that goes around the table of, is that person the traitor or are they just off doing their own little thing? And um, it, this is a highly thematic game. Like you're, um, the characters just have a lot of cool little quirks and powers. Uh, one of the main features is this thing called the Crossroads deck, which is a card that you draw every round that someone else at the table will sort of hold on to. And when a certain condition is met, either this person travels to this location or if a zombie gets killed, then read this part of the story right. and trigger an event. So it just adds these little sort of spikes of like storytelling to the game that feels pretty unique. And they're, it's just it's so full of flavor. It's it's a really cool little experience. Um, I would say this was something that might have been further, further up my list. Uh, it tends to drag yeah. at four to five players. I almost wouldn't play this anymore except at three players, which is very specific because that's also the minimum count. Hmm. So um, I think that that makes it feel like about the right length. And yeah. I'm just happy they uh, finally revealed or they were honest and called the expansion the long night because this game is entirely <laughs> too long <laughs> yeah. uh, and ruins yeah. everyone's night. I, I, that, that, yeah, it's funny because I, it certainly I would never play this at five. Four is fine, maybe longer than you want it to be. And yeah, like I said, three is probably the right amount of time. Because I think if you played with three players, it would be 90, 90 minutes, two hours. And that, that feels acceptable. I've only played this a couple times. I feel like one th another thing aside from the length that I don't like so much is I feel like people's individual goals, They t it seems like it's a scramble at the end to achieve them. Is that have not been your experience? Like it feels um, like everybody's sort of working toward the common goal. And once that seems to be achievable or whatever, towards the end of the game, there's... A, everyone there's, rushes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, I don't know maybe if that's been my experience of it, to be honest. Um, 
I, I think one of the one of the ways that this does it sometimes breaks down is that you're like oh at the end of the game you might be like okay guys maybe if we can if we right. do my goal that would be cool for me and <laughs> right. that that feels a little bit out of the spirit of the game yeah. but but yeah um, otherwise no I haven't had that problem that are cool. you allowed to explicitly reveal your goal I think it's one of those things that probably is not actually in the rules like yeah you could probably play it either way because um, you could pu play the purely cooperative game where everyone just has a public objective I guess but I don't think the rules clarify I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd love to do this again at three because as of now, it would fit on my like potentially top 10 disappointing games of all yeah, time. Yeah, I think that I remember so much of the trappings yeah, that I want to like. Exactly. I, I remember when we played it, that was a very weird game. I think you died, had your character die like instantly on the second turn or something like that. Right. And you were the traitor, unsurprisingly. It's balanced. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we'd be loath to talk about... Uh, that game without talking about the other Crossroads game that just came out, right? Oh, that's true. Gen yeah, Gen 7. Gen 7 is the second second Crossroads game. So, right. yeah, I'm excited to see how that, that works out. Yeah. Uh, okay. That is the end of winter. My number 35, 35th best game of all time, so better than all of these other games that anyone has talked to to this point, uh, is a party game called Sixes. Um, Sixes is... Uh, hysterical uh, and the meta game that has evolved within our group is perhaps better than the game itself uh, sixes is uh, basically a pictionary no not pictionary what is it it's categories variant categories, yeah. uh, in the first round of the game everyone is trying to uh, match another player so you have to write six things that uh, match with airports uh, for example uh, and then anything you write down whether that's airplane pilot as long as someone else at the table has written that down you score a point uh, in the second round, you do the same thing, but you need unique items. So imagine that it's airports again. So people are trying to come up with airline, Alaska Airlines, for example, um, as a, a unique example that maybe no one else wrote it. But if anyone else writes it down, uh, you don't get that point. Uh, and then the third round is sort of a lightning round with a bunch of different categories. Um, what, what has evolved uh, in our group is sort of a, a diplomatic diplomacy style <laughs> game uh, where we are allowed to vote on whether someone's answer counts or not. Um, in match rounds, it's not that contentious, but in uh, does this item fit into that category? Um, I know we have a bunch of famous examples. The, of essentially, well, yeah, the well-known air airplane yeah, is air in, is air in an airport? Is right. that what it is? Oh, airport. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Air, airport. Um, and then one was like about bugs and spiders, or was it? Yes. Spider? Yeah. Is, is a spider, spider a bug? bug? Which it's not. Uh, <laughs> if you look up the actual definition, I would love to, in the comments or email us. Let us know if you think a spider is a bug. Um, but essentially, what happens is you're trying to rally support for your bad answer, <laughs> and then you know if someone votes for you in one round, then you you try to cash in. You know, they'll, they'll cash in later. Hey, I vote for you on that stupid answer <laughs> um it, it becomes a really funny loud um kind of meaner than it should be game so if that doesn't sound uh, you'll know if this sounds fun to you yeah um our group uh plays it all the time and really gets into the spirit of we're just sort of screaming at each other uh, and that is sixes um okay my number 35 another game by the doctor you keep trying to peek uh this is in my opinion his best auction game i know Oh, one of our uh, listeners, Todd, is going to vehemently, dis vehemently disagree because he's a big Raw fan. Uh, so sorry, Todd. But uh, for me, it's the number, number 35 game is Modern Art. Uh, Modern Art is purely an auction game. Um, what you're doing is there's five suits representing five different artists. Uh, the new version of this game, I'd only played the older version where the art was a little lackluster, but... Um, the new version, the art is colorful and vibrant and really great. And so each card you have represents a piece of art by, by an artist. And all you're doing is you are auctioning off uh, these pieces of art. Uh, and you can do it in one of five ways. It depends on the um, the, the, the card. The card will tell you how that, that piece of art is auctioned. But it can be a, a once around. It can be a blind bid. It can be uh, an open bid. Uh, there's just there's five different types of auctions. And um, you keep doing that until the end of the round. And then the way scoring works in the game is the artist who has sold the most pieces of art uh, scores the most points that round. And then second will score second and third will score the third most. And then the artists who are finishing fourth and fifth place don't score at all. So you're trying to sort of like in a, in a thematic sense, I know this is not certainly not the most thematic game, but you're trying to be like, uh, on the cutting edge of the art world is the idea. You're trying to like buy the best artists. And another thing I really like about this game is it, I think it plays five or six rounds. I'm not sure. Um, but the values of the art 
that um, have accumulated in previous rounds go on um, for for later rounds. So if an artist ha has scored, you know, thir is worth thirty thousand in the first round, that thirty thousand will carry over and perhaps gain in value as rounds progress. But um, if they don't score first, second, or third most, if they don't sell the first, second, or third most paintings, they don't score at all. So there may be an artist that has like consistently scored and now the art is worth a lot but if in that particular round you don't sell his art he's not going to score at all so it's a, just a, again a very interesting kinesia style interesting scoring method um and it's just my favorite uh, my favorite auction game and uh the new edition is beautiful and i just love it uh so that's 35 modern arts this is on my shelf of shame this is, i really want to play game. it yeah, but it's know. like they're Four different types of auctions. There are that you five have. different types of auctions. That's yeah. nuts, man. I mean, if if you want to auction, this is the auction game. You know what I mean? This is nothing but auction. Cool. Um, my number thirty-five game is Agricola. Uh, we've spoken about this already. Um, Agricola was, I think, my introduction to Uwe Rosenberg as a designer, uh, and it, it's it's great. Uh, the it, it's it's that sort of mean worker placement that we've already alluded to this, ep this episode where there are spots that you sort of vitally need and you're sort of hoping that someone won't take them before you do. Um, the aspect of like building fences to sort of house your animals is just satisfying from like a construction component. Uh, the one thing I will mention that I didn't mention when we were talking about earlier that I think Kellen sort of alluded to is I think the occupation cards are where this starts to wear on me a little bit, bit like the, the, um, the relative value of the cards and sort of knowing which cards are good as part of like the draft mechanic at the start of the game is something that bugs me a little bit. Well, and you don't even that's drafting is a variant, right? There's the, oh, that's not. Oh, I think uh, I, that, that's how I've always yeah. Done there's it, a think. couple different versions. There's one where everybody gets ten cards and discards down to seven. Oh, maybe I have and done then that. Then there's think of it. there's other versions where you just draft just get, every oh, right, single yeah. card. The the problem is the power levels of some of these cards are pretty disparate. disparate. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's new additions of Agricola that I believe have been pruning out. Um, okay, well that's cool. Some of that, which is is nice. Yeah, I, it's, it's it's like I feel like I like so much about Agricola, but just that one layer is the thing that sort of keeps pulling me away from it because I just feel like you're never going to adequately sort of perform compared to someone that knows those cards extremely really right. well. Um, but that's Agricola, my number 35. It's a great game. I like it a lot. I had that at 50. Yeah. You like it more than me. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, all right, my number 34, best game of all time, is uh, Lords of Vegas. Uh, Lords of Vegas is frequently cited as sort of a Monopoly replacement, um, which I don't understand at all. Um, uh, in Lords of Vegas, everyone is building casinos, um, and you're building casinos similarly to sort of like a Chinatown-style board or an Acquire-style bo board, this grid, um, and you're building a casino uh, and trying to sort of make money. Um, but what's fun about the game is that you can actually gamble at each other's casinos. Um, so you're jostling for casino, casino. If two casinos connect, that forms uh, sort of a takeover. And so one, uh, one player will get to control that mega casino. And so you're jostling to have your casinos. There's an expansion that lets you build those casinos up into the air. Um, but then truly my favorite mechanic is when you get behind, you say, well, I'm going to have to go to Mark's <laughs> casino and we're going to try to make this right. Uh, and that involves rolling a bunch of dice and Mark is likely to win uh, as most casinos uh, operate or as all casinos operate. Um, but you have a chance and uh, that chance can turn the tides. Uh, this is a really, really uh, thematic fun game. I've replaced all the money with real poker chips um, it's a ton of fun to bring it out. It's perhaps a little long, uh, and I haven't played it in a few years. I don't know if either of you have played this, I've right? Played I this. played it, yeah. I oh, think you I have? Not with you, I don't think, but I have yeah, played this. Yeah, I don't think yeah. you've played it with me. Do you enjoy it at all? Yeah, no, I liked it. I didn't I didn't love it, but I, I liked it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's one that I think is, uh, once again, more than the sum of its parts. Somehow it comes together in this experience that I'm just laughing. You know, I, I had a famous game of it in my family where my brother and sister came down to the last die roll, and it was like, if it's one, two, or three, you know, Paxton wins. If it's four, five, or six, you know, Peyton wins. And my brother was so mad that this had happened. <laughs> he lost, but it, but even still, just the idea that the game could be decided by that is perfect. That's exactly Lords of Vegas. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. Duh. <laughs> uh, it's a great game, um, but but it's it's pretty silly. Yeah, I really want to play this. Um, my number 34 is by Thomas 
I'm going to mention his name. The Ganius Lesperons. Thomas, you know who you are. Uh, this is Decrypto. Um, uh, it's a word game that is super simple and yet super clever. Um, the the way it's played is uh, team. It's for team versus team. And just the part that I cannot get over is that to start the game, you know the exact four words that your team is going to deal with the entire game. There's no like secret words. There's no, it's just the fact that you are shown these four words. The, the opponents don't see them, but you have these four words. And every turn, and the words are numbered one through four. And every turn, the um, clue giver is going to draw a card that will have three of those numbers in a particular order. So maybe three, three, one, four, or one, two, three, whatever. And they need to give clues. They're, they see this card secretly and they need to give clues to their teammates that will make them guess those words in that specific order. Uh, at the same time, the other team is listening in on the clues and throughout the game, they are listening into more and more clues and they're trying to figure out which clues lead to which numbers. Um, and every round they get to guess what, what number the clue is related to. So, you know, if you start hearing a lot of um, uh, clues that are color related, and the guesses have seemed to been going to to number four. You know, you may guess when it's when you're, and that that's your opponent's clues. You may guess we think that's number four, and and if you match the exact order, you get a point where you steal a point. And the other way points are scored are is a negative fashion. If in giving the clues to your teammates, if you try to get because you start there gets a point in the game where you start getting very concerned that the other team is picking up on your clues and you start trying to get cute with your clues, but you can't get too cute because if your team incorrectly guesses the three words in the specific order, you get a negative point. And the first, uh, and if you get either two negative points or the other team scores two interception points, they win. Um, it's, it's a little hard. Uh, maybe my my uh, description has clued you into this. It's a little hard to describe to yeah. players. It's sort of notorious for that. Um, it's one of the few games where I feel like you could say, "Let's just play a first round you'll and get you'll it. get it." Yeah. Um, but it's once you get it, it's so simple. But that I, I don't know why. Maybe it's just so, a quirk of mine. But the fact that you can see these four words, I I just can't get over how obvious that is but how clever that is um so for me that's number 34 decrypto would you believe me if i told you that 34 was decrypto there you go well? i should have hopped in should've i should have <laughs> I, I felt like just shouting yeah out, go ahead yeah yeah uh no, i mean i don't have much more to say about it like yeah. it's, it's it's a fantastic game um it's it's one of those games that sort of like feels like a code name's replacement is maybe being too strong but it's in the same vein but it feels much more yeah. gamery oh yeah and yeah. uh a lot more stressful whenever you're the clue giver in it because the clue giver just rotates yeah you're like I, I don't know what I'm going to do that's not going to give this away. Right. Because it, it, it gets harder and harder as the game progresses as well. It's it's a really, really cool game. Yeah. And I, I love it. Uh, this is actually one of only, I think, three games from 2018 on my list as well. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's shooting up my list. Um, I Yeah, it's a fantastic game. Absolutely. That's my number 34. Right. All right. We are now on to the 33rd best game of all time. And that game is Wiz War. Uh, Wiz War is a super mm. silly game. Uh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. This is a uh, classic game that has been around for uh, many years, probably Keep longer than you guys have been alive. Maybe it'll be close. Let's not, not look that up. I've been around forever. <laughs> um, Wiz War is a um, put wizards in a castle, give them a bunch of spells that feel like you're playing Magic the Gathering, and then beat each other up. What number are we at? 470. Not good. Uh, these guys got wrecked uh, <laughs> in their first game and only game of Wiz War, so do not listen to their uh, voices of non-authority. Um, Wiz War has this uh, fantastic ability to make everyone feel powerful on your turn. There is unlimited possibilities. Each card uh, can be used for its spell or it can be used to power up another spell. So you sit there and go, well, I really want to put Mark in a cage that he can't get out of. Right but I also want to use this fireball and it's sort of like, which should I do? Um, the game devolves very frequently into just hitting each other uh, and, and doing silly things, turning each other into giants into, <laughs> you know, freezing them or skip a turn sort of mechanics. Um, the newest addition from fantasy flight 
Um, they kind of care bared it just a little bit. They took out a lot of, they, they added a lot of counter spells and made it a little easier to sort of maneuver your way through. But, um, most people on the board game geek forum have removed most of those cards to bring it back to its former glory. Uh, the intent of this is clearly a beer and pretzels game. It's a, we're going to set up and do funny things with cards and it's going to take 45 minutes and we're going to have a great time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it succeeds. Uh, I think it's a triumph, uh, in, in that <laughs> regard. Um, but you have to know what you're getting into and you have to have gamery friends. Um, I'm a little surprised you guys don't like it more just given the fact that we are the perfect audience to play it. Right. For me, it's just a little too janky. It's a little too, yeah. like a little too, I don't know, like feels like not coupled together, but I get that sense. Like it just feels a little too off. I like that, but it's just a little too much for me. Uh, that said, oh, you no, no, I was gonna say that there were mo- like, like there were moments where I felt you could do fun things, but a lot of the times I was like, I don't want to do any of these things in my hand. It just it didn't feel like consistent at delivering yeah. what I wanted from it. Right, but I do. I mean, some of the like thematically, some of the things that we did yeah. in the game were like it's hilarious, funny like, as heck. Yeah, I was, didn't we have like somebody like burst through through a wall? A wall? Yeah, <laughs> somebody thought they were safe and then yes. they burst through. <laughs> And, and there's like a there's like a thing where you can like flood the board. Of yeah, water. or rotate. Yeah. Ro- so Ro- someone yeah. thinks they're right by the treasure, and then <laughs> yeah. you just rotate the entire yeah. map that they're on. Right. It's so funny. I'm gonna move it up to 469. <laughs> <laughs> me. Just from this, this right. nostalgic. You sold, yeah. you sold me. Nice. Uh, my number 33 is by Jens Dog Muller and Helge Ostertag, who came together again for Gaia Project. This is their. F- I haven't played Gaia Project, so I'm listing their former game, uh, Terra Mystica, as my number 33. Uh, this is a area control route builder sort of game. Um, uh, again, asymmetry, which shows up a lot on my list. This game is, uh, each faction is, has a lot of asymmetric powers. Um, I like the fact that you, there's a give and take, and I don't know if this is the same in Gaia project, but, um, you are trying to, you, you get bonuses when you build your, uh, buildings close to um, other characters, yeah, you, but you also can. You also, when you do that, you risk getting hemmed in. That's exactly yeah, it. Like okay. you're incentivized to sort of get close to other players, right? But it's, it's but, obviously dangerous, to right? Do that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I, you know, this is a, a classic. Um, I think it's. I know it's top ten on BGG. I, I, I've just. Um, it's very thinky, very well designed. Um, I don't think they don't have the the terraforming thing anymore in Gaia Project, right? You don't no, care. that's there. Oh, it is still there. there. Okay. Yeah. Well, th- that's another thing I, I like the fact that you can basically go to any spot you want, but you may have to pay a cost, uh, and you can try to get more efficient in in, mm-hmm. in paying a cost. Some some races, that's you know that's one of their powers is the is that cost is reduced. Um, this is just a a really fun super heavy euro where I think the biggest sell is aside from the asymmetric powers. This this thing I was talking about about. You want to get you want to rub up against your opponents in terms of spatially, but you risk getting cut off, and that can be uh, brutal. Um, so I'm excited to play Gaia Project one of these days, but for right now, uh, Terra Mystica is my number thirty three. Terra Mystica was a weird one. I, it didn't make my list, but it was very very close. Uh, that there's something about the restrictive the restriction of like you were saying like the way you can get hemmed in that yeah. feels a little bit harsh sometimes and also some of the aspects like the the ability to transport you know you have to build up your river transport in order to do things right. there were some things that felt a little bit weird to me in yeah. Terra Mystica uh, I didn't play it probably as much as it deserves um, but yeah I liked it a lot yeah it's like the heavier the Euro game though the more that the asymmetric factions need to be balanced. Right. And, and I think like, these are not balanced. Yeah. Terra Mystic is famously yeah. very unbalanced, right. I think. Yeah. Which, but it, it also, I mean, it's definitely a problem, but it also, when you're playing against people who are less or more experienced, you can sort of like nerf them that yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. But that's actually in some ways where it gets weirder because if you were playing it with people that are very experienced, they have pretty good stats on like how you would adjust victory points value right. to each faction. Yes, but sure. that probably goes away when you're playing with new players right. because who can say? Yes, yeah, right. It's That's true. it's a hard thing because yeah. in in tournaments you bid in victory you bid points, victory points, yeah. points yeah. choose your faction. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting game. Um, I there. It's weird that they're doing another expansion for it. Yeah, even though Gaia Post Project, Gaia Project right. yeah. and that the expansion is not compatible with the other Terra Mystica expansion. Fire and Ice. Yeah, is it interesting? Strange. Uh, my number 33 game is Soul. I didn't write down the subtitle. So oh. is it Lost Days of a Dying Star? 
Sounds right. Lost, Lost days, days of, of, days of, of a star. star. Of a star. Yeah. Of a star. Yeah. Uh, yeah th this we mentioned this already. This is fantastic. Uh, it's it's a game that it's one of the few games that sort of really speaks to me thematically. I love science fiction movies, and this feels like you're playing a science fiction yeah. movie. Um, the things that maybe we didn't mention there's this pattern forming component that I really like, where you're sort of trying to align your ships into specific shapes in order right. to create structures, yes. which is it's just like an interesting little puzzle that I liked. But the way you describe that the mother ships move around the circle. So good, yeah. so good. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that uh, I really like is, to some extent, the game is largely decided and determined by the five different card powers you have. So almost every game feels completely different yeah. right. based just on those five cards. That's yeah. almost entirely the extent of what you can do with the cards in your hand is just dictated by the five powers you draw for that game. Um, so it feels radically different every single and time. And I like the fact that you only can ever keep one card. Right. So it's not like you have a hand of cards exactly. and you're debating what to do or you're lo you know, there's only ever one thing that you can do. Yeah. Really, really cool game. That's Saul Lost Days of a Star. My 32, my 32nd best game of all time is uh, Shh. Wow. Uh, this is a uh, Paco game. Uh, this is a cooperative game, a cooperative word game. Wow. I'm saying it. Uh, in sh sh <laughs> you have uh, every uh, letter of the alphabet. Um, the vowels are out of the deck, and you're trying to form words together without talking. Um, so it leads to really silly situations where someone is trying to spell a specific word, and you don't understand what they're trying to get you to spell. Um, what I love about this is that it fits. These pack of games are literally you know, about this size uh, of a pack of gum. Uh, the cards are super small and cute. Uh, the game is very clever and does not overstay its welcome. Uh, it's one of those ones that I'd recommend to almost anyone as a good modern game to have in their collection. Uh, yeah, Neelan's even borrowing it to take it home. Yeah, for... exactly. It seems like the perfect little game to take on the holiday because it's tiny. Yeah. It's, it's just um, every time I play it, and every subsequent time I played it, I think, oh, this is a little bit more clever than I remember it from the last time. Um, and for a filler game, that's quite that's quite good. Um, you know, you pull out some of these filler games that you played once, and then you play it again, and you're like, yeah, that was the same, the exact same thing as what happened last mm -hmm. time. Is 32 and Biblios doesn't make your list? That's right. As a filler game? I'm 100% serious. It is a travesty. I don't even know how that to spell. Justice. <laughs> it's either S-H-H or S-S-H, <laughs> <or S -S> <laughs> yeah. but it's better than Biblios. That is so wrong. Uh, my number 32, Mr. Rosenberg makes a reappearance. This is Lahav. Um, I love, this is again, this is his back to his, uh, resource management conversion. What I love about this is how, again, tightly designed this is. It's a little looser than Agricola, but it's still, but it's tight in a different way. Uh, what you're doing on your turn is you are moving your ship down this track the track indicates how long a round lasts and you're just filling um, the resource spots where your ship landed. So these resources are are slowly building up, but on your turn, you can do one of two things. You can pick up uh, one of these resources that have been filled up uh, and you just, you just take it, or there's a worker placement aspect to it, which is the other thing you can do, and you're placing your one worker. So you only ever have one worker uh, throughout the whole game. And you can either place them on your own buildings, which you've bought with the resources you've gathered, uh, and if you do that, you get whatever the building uh, gives uh, or you make the conversion or whatever you want to do, uh, but you do it for free. However, you can also place your worker on the communal spots, uh, which is which represent the town, or on any of your opponent's spots, which is a very, again, a, sort of a tacky, interesting uh, mechanism. Although if you go to the town or to your opponents, you have to pay them some, some amount of gold or food or whatever. Um, What's cool about that though is in addition to being able to use your opponent's spots, which I always like in a game where you can when you can jump into an opponent's tableau, like sort of key flower, that whole, whole thing, is the fact that you can jump into your opponent's building and you can just sit there. So you're not you, like for round to round. Now you that doesn't mean you don't get you don't continue to get the resource, but you block them from getting the resource. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's like an interesting thing. The only way that they can dislodge you at that point is to actually sell the, the, the building to the city. So like if they really want it, they can force you out. But it's just, it's just really interesting in that, in that respect. And the fact that you only have one worker, you're only doing one thing, very simple. You don't have to overanalyze. Uh, there's a feeder uh, workers thing, which is a hallmark for Rosenberg games, which is done really well in this game. Um, and it's just, it's just, I've only played it a couple times, but I just loved 
my plays. And I think this is a game that definitely feels like it's going to move up my list. It feels like the perfect level of Rosenberg resource gathering uh, management conversion. So uh, 32 for me is Le Havre. My number 32 game is Orléans. Uh, this is a bag building engine game. Um, the premise being that you sort of have, you start with four basic workers and you have an action board where you can spend those workers in order to sort of get more. These workers are all in the form of chips that just go into your bag and every round you're gonna draw a certain number of them and find how, and de- sorry, and decide how you're gonna allocate those onto your action spaces. So one action space might require a white chip and a blue chip and a which represent different workers um or one might require a different combination so then give based on what you draw you would assign those to different actions and then perform those actions in sequence uh this is all in service of like I said getting more workers more chips to put into your bag perhaps increasing how many you're going to draw in a given round um getting you uh getting guys that will give you sort of more victory points there is sort of a board that you can turn chips in which you'd probably do towards the end of the game in order to sort of get uh, points and sort of other rewards. Um, this is a game that I really, really enjoy. Uh, there is, you know, like any sort of deck builder, there's a randomness to the, you know, hoping you're going to get the things that you're going to, that you're going to need. Um, but I re- really enjoy this one. It's, it's always been super satisfying to play. I've never felt like the randomness has sort of really detracted from my enjoyment of the game. Um, yeah, that's all I on. I'm a big fan of all I on. There's what's, what I find super interesting about this is how much it seems to have been enhanced by expansions as well. Yeah. I think you were saying that there's is it the trade and intrigue yes expansion that adds a cooperative yeah which is supposed to be very yeah. very good um, and the other one which is uh, in, no that's the invasion invasion does that okay does that uh, but trade and intrigue in, uh, changes the main board yeah in a very positive right. way introduces some other things yeah it's really a really good game really good uh, expansion yeah that's all I on my number thirty one best game of all time, uh, is Keyflower. Uh, Keyflower is so good, um, and manages to be a Euro-ish game, uh, that, that still feels highly, highly interactive. Um, what happens in a game of Keyflower is that you are bidding, uh, uh, to acquire the hexagons, hexagons in the, uh, middle of the board. Um, but you can only bid with one of three different colors, and there's a fourth sort of special color. But if I start a bid with red, um, Mark can only fight me for that space uh, with red workers as well. Um, and what that does is everybody has sort of a random assortment of what colors they start around with. Um, so you can kind of know maybe that Mark doesn't have any red, and Mark and I are going to be the two that are fighting over this. and Sort of get out early, put a worker out there so that he can't, um, go after that space. And so each round you're bidding to get these hexagons uh, that then go into your your board. If that was the only tension to it, it would be great, but you actually are also balancing another tension, which is you can spend workers to actually just use the tile. Um, so you can bid to acquire the tile for subsequent rounds, or you can just say, I'm going to use the tile. Uh, this has similar to Lahav. It allows you to use tiles uh, in, in other players' uh, areas, but then they get that meeple uh, for the subsequent round. So you have to balance, is this worth me getting what I need right now, but helping Mark on a future turn? Um, the, the sort of Yuri engine underneath and the tile placement, I'm a little less sold on, but this, this upfront mechanic of how you are acquiring um, the hexagons makes it so good and so tense the entire way through. Um, that is Keyflower. What do you guys think of Keyflower? I like Keyflower a lot. I, I think the only reason it didn't make like my list is because the time I played it, we were perhaps playing by slightly funky rules. Yeah. So it's hard to know how, exactly how the actual game uh, would feel, but uh, I really want to play it more. It's definitely a, it's a game that I've almost picked up for myself this year. I'm really excited to play more of it. The one thing I don't like so much about it is the movement aspect, yeah. where you have to move around your tableau. But it's still, it is a fantastic game. And that's actually one of those interesting things, because when I was thinking of getting Keyflower, like Key to the City that we spoke about yeah. at some point, doesn't have that roots, that sort of root building thing. Yeah. But it also shaves off enough of the other edges that I yeah. don't think it's quite the right replacement. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah, I'm not sure which of those I would prefer in the long run. That's Keyflower. All right, for my number 31, I'm going to break the code name seal. I know it's going to appear on, I don't know, but I think it's going to appear on everybody's list. But for me, it's 31, Vlada Shvatel. Shvatel, I don't, yeah, okay. probably. <laughs> um, 
This is, uh, I mean, this is a classic. I'm, you know, I, it's, I feel silly explaining it because if anybody watching this list or listening to this podcast uh, knows all about it, it's sort of been called passwords or password meets battleship. You have a grid of words in front of you. Um, the clue, it's a team versus team game. Uh, you're trying to get your team to guess the words uh, without having them accidentally guess the opponent's clues or the assassin card, which will end the game. Um, this is like, I, I think I've met, called a, a number of games classics, but I think this is the most classic of the new classics. This is a game I think that will appear at uh, in like complete non gamers like game collection, sure. a la you know Sorry and Scrabble and stuff like that. This is like just you know you can introduce it to anybody uh, during any circumstance and it'll be a hit. Uh, I've done it. I've introduced it to plenty of non gamers. They all love it. We never played just one game. We always run it back. Uh, code names. I mean. You need to have it, basically. Yeah, I think also it definitely has like the requisite legs that it's we're going to be talking about this game yeah. years and years from now. Well, for people, sure. yeah, once it starts getting out to the general populace, as it were. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. That's um, thirty-one code names. My number thirty-one is Gaia Project. Oh, okay. Um, so this did make my list because it does. It's sort of. It's funny because one of the things I need sort of hedge when I talk about Gaia Project is it does actually add some complications to Terra Mystica, but it also shaves off some of the things I don't like about Terra Mystica. Um, so this is the pseudo sequel, the spiritual successor to Terra Mystica by the same designers. It is space themed, which also probably goes a long way to sort of what to saying why I like it. It feels it's it, it possible to say for me to say whether the factions are more balanced, but what I do like about the new map for the game is it's just sort of areas of space just sparsely populated with planets. So there doesn't feel like there's a strong um, getting hedged in by other players. There's always a way that even if you're sort of on one side of the map to sort of terraform a planet on the other side of the map and sort of just move to there. Okay. At a huge expense of resources, but you never feel like you're completely trapped in. Um, it also sort of it, it makes the river transport system a little bit more elegant by just reducing that to distances. And it sort of introduces the super resource that you can spend to sort of boost your distance, like I said, if you need to sort of emergency exit out of a sector. Um, it also adds this really, well, it turns the cult track, which I think is something that is kind of divisive yeah. in Terra Mystica, especially at two players. I think it gets a little bit weird. It turns into this massive sort of tech tree where a lot of like the mechanics, like the river transport in Terra Mystica become just techs on this board. Okay. So it kind of, it takes a lot of the elements and puts them into one place. Um, and this tech tree, well, not a tree, but this sort of, this tech board is fantastic. It's like these six sort of levels of technology that you move up as you sort of build your... Um, I forget what they're called, the research centers, which are like the universities in Terra Mystica. Okay. Um, so yeah, it just it it feels like it, it feels like a refinement in all ways I like, um, and it's a game that I was immediately much more willing to want to go back to okay. than, than Terra Mystica. Uh, that is Gaia Project. You spend more time though looking at your own player board and doing a puzzle than you do caring about the main board. I don't think that's true at all. No, no, I don't. I mean, Terra Mystica, I think placement, board placement is vital. Gaia Project, less so, but it's certainly, you're, you're hot competing for these spots. I mean, there aren't that many of them. And especially, like, depending on the way the scoring has been sort of engineered for that game, like, certain colored planets might be very important. So you're you're desperately hoping that someone else at the table isn't going to have the means to go to a planet before you do. Or if they do, you want to be able to maybe get close enough to them that you'll benefit off of them. The, the, the board playing interactivity is strong. I wouldn't say it's not necessarily really a highly interactive game because yeah, a large part of what you're doing is trying to optimize your player, Matt. Um, but yeah, I think the, the competition for space is a big part of it for sure. I, well, I, I don't know that I agree with you. I just, I, I feel like any game where you are, um, like you see what you want to do on the board, but then you have to look at another player board and sort of solve a, like no, a math puzzle to figure out ever, if you can no, no, do no. that. I don't think you would ever be looking at someone's player board. It's unnecessarily, I don't know. No, looking at your own player board oh, and oh, trying to like, how can I do that thing and let me solve seven math problems right. here in order to do one thing, thing on there. the board? Yeah, is, yeah. And that's why I don't care for Terra Mystica. I've not played Gaia Project, but that's what it felt like the couple of times I played. Yeah, Terra that's Mystica. fair. And also, it's worth clarifying that I also don't think that if you if you hate Terra Mystica, Gaia Project doesn't solve right. the things that you hate about it. Like, yeah. it, it refines it in a way that sort of makes it better for me. But but yeah, so it's certainly largely the same game. Uh, that's Gaia Project. And that's going to do it 
for this episode that it was our 40 to 31 picks so yeah, yeah three more parts as we get to number one they only on our get top better. 50 list yeah absolutely um thank you guys so much as always um please check us out on our social media uh we're on twitter we're on facebook uh, join the discussion on our, on our guild. That's at boardgamebarrage.com forward slash guild. Um, yeah, we talk about the episodes there. It's a good place to sort of reach out to us. We're pretty active on there and, and on Reddit as well. Uh, that's going to do it for the episode. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. See ya. Bye.